remain standing for the reading of God's Word. It's going to be in 2 Kings chapter 4, verses 1 through 7. I want to minister for just a few moments on the subject of what do you have? 2 Kings chapter 4, verses 1 through 7. The wife of a man from the company of the prophets cried out to Elisha, Your servant, my husband, is dead. And you know that he revered the Lord. But now his creditor is coming to take my two boys as his slaves. Elisha replied to her, How can I help you? Tell me, what do you have in your house? Can you say, what do you have? What do you have? Your servant has nothing. Say nothing. Nothing. Nothing there at all, she said, except a small jar of olive oil. Elisha said, go around and ask all your neighbors for empty jars. Don't ask for just a few. Then go inside and shut the door behind you and your sons. Pour oil into the jars, and as each is filled, put it to the side. She left him and shut the door behind her and her sons, and they brought the jars to her, and she kept pouring. When all the jars were full, she said to her son, Bring me another one. But he replied, There is not a jar left. Notice that the oil stops pouring when the, there are no more vessels to be filled. Then the oil stopped flowing, she went and told the man of God, and he said, Go sell the oil and pay your debts. You and your sons can live on what is left. May God have a blessing to the reading of this word this morning. You may be seated. So as we look at this story, you may have read it before, or it may be new to you. There is a woman whose husband used to be a part of the prophets. He was part of the school of prophets, if you want to be specific. And Elisha essentially was the dean of that school. And her husband was had served under him and studied under Elisha. And imagine in her desperation as she comes to Elisha and she tells him that her husband has died, that he is gone. This morning, I wonder... Have we ever felt like our hope was gone? This man, because of the times, the woman probably did not work or could not work. And so he was the source of her provision, the source of her hope. And sometimes I believe that even us as Christians in this day, that we can lose our hope. And certainly the world has lost hope or never found hope. Because they don't know Jesus. We don't know the conditions of his death. We don't know how it came about. And we don't understand the financial specifics or the problems. What we do know is that it's bad. Very bad. Bad to the point that the creditors are about to come. And about to put her sons into indentured slavery. That they might be able to pay back what is owed. Now, when we look at this, many times we can look and see that the creditor is coming and that maybe even identify the creditor as someone who was bad. But the legal system in that day would not have allowed this woman to declare bankruptcy. Many options that we have today, she would not have had. So the only choice was that her sons be taken from her and be put into slavery. And as we look at this, I think it's very significant to understand that this woman is given no name. It does not declare who she is, although I believe that Elisha knew who she was. I believe that if you were training up someone, that you would probably at least have a, a, on a main basis with their spouse. And so we see that she has no name. She's not mentioned. She has a name, but her name is not spelled out. And I believe it's significant because these are universal principles 
that can be applied to our life. In other words, it doesn't really matter her name, but what matters is that God can do the same for us. And that we can put ourselves in the place of this woman and understand her dilemma, but also understand that God is moving in on the scene. That God is about to make a way where there seems to be no way. That the God of provision and the God of finance and the God who knows no lack is about to step upon the scene. God could have provided immediately for this woman. She would not have had to lift a finger. And at times we know that God does that sort of thing. That God does not at times require any intervention, any work on our part. And we see this especially in the story of creation. That God on that first day saw that there was no light. And he spoke and he said, let there be light. And there was light. So we know that God is not limited and that God can step in and that at times he does, but at times he chooses to partner with us. Now partner is a strong word because God does the most of it. But many times God wants us to put something out there that will be a, a platform for God to use. A, 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 a thing that God can say, uh, well, they put this forward, they've got a little bit of faith in me, they believe a little bit that I might be able to move in this situation. It's kind of like the story of Joshua, the children of Israel, as they are about to enter the promised land. And by the way, we started the book of Joshua on Wednesdays, and wow, what a first chapter that we talked about it. And we, we see that God speaks through his angel to Joshua and he tells him, I am giving you the land and I have already given you the land. And so I imagine if I was Joshua, I'd be like, yeah, praise the Lord. I don't have to do anything. But then shortly after that, the Lord tells him, Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you. In other words, you've got to walk it out. There's a faith that is required. You can't just stay here and experience the blessing and the provision of God, but God says you need to walk it out. You need to take some steps of faith in order to inherit the promises of God and the provision of God. There are times that we have uh, to take a step of faith, though it may be a small step, God many times requires that. You see, as we look at this, and this woman, she had to gather the pots, gather the vessels, assemble them. If they were full of something, she had to empty them. They had to be put in the right position in order for oil to be poured into them, and they had to remain in the right position for the miracle to come to pass. You see, God was partnering with her. What an honor that God would partner with us. What a privilege that the God of the universe who can speak and literally light will come to pass and light will come on the scene and trees will be formed and universes will be uh, manifested. But God said, no, I want to partner with my children. Why does God want us to partner with him? Because participation creates appreciation. You ever had something just handed to you? Or have you ever had something that you had to work a little bit for? Which one did you appreciate the most? You see, many times as we partner with God, we understand and develop a greater appreciation for what he has done and for who he is. Because we understand how little our contribution was and how great God is and how little what we put into it and how great the results that God gave to us. Participation creates appreciation. So Elisha comes to her and he asks her, what do you have? Now, on a cursory reading of this, we think, 
Why in the world would the man of God, who represents God and the Word of God, come to this poor widowed woman who has, in her words, nothing and say, what do you have? Because he understands as well that as we participate, we grow an appreciation for God. You see, it's often that God says, bring me something tangible to demonstrate and to activate your faith. I'm reminded, and we don't have any of those up here, we need to get some, but we have often used little pieces of cloth we call prayer cloths. And can I tell you that those prayer cloths are not magical. They are simply a tangible thing that we can place our hands upon and pour a little anointing oil upon and then our faith is activated because there has been something tangible put in front of us. So the woman says, your servant has nothing there at all. Have you ever felt like you had nothing? Nothing to offer God. Nothing that was worthy of the Almighty God. And have you ever uh, felt like there was just nothing that you had to offer? Well, this woman was in that position. No husband. No income. No prospects. Her husband is already dead, and it appears that her sons will be sold into slavery. Her husband has passed, leaving her nothing. Except a bottle of oil. You see, it was so little that to her it seemed like nothing. But God's description of nothing and our description of nothing are very different, vastly different. And God can use the little that we bring in order to bring about a miracle in our lives. Her perception of nothing in God's perception was different. And I tell you that God has always been in the business of making something out of what appears to be nothing. Amen. That's, that's just the kind of God that he is. He says, bring me your impossibilities, bring me your little, bring me your lack, and see what I can do with it. If it's nothing but a pot of oil, watch me multiply it. If it's nothing but a handful of meal in the bottom of a barrel, God says, watch me lick it, make it last through the drought. If it's nothing but five small barley loaves and two fish, God says, watch me feed 5,000. If it's nothing but a small stone from a brook, God says, watch me take out the giant and destroy the enemy because you have given me your nothing and I'll make something of it. If it's nothing but a little walking stick, God says, watch me divide the Red Sea so that you can pass over on dry land. If it's nothing but a little bit of mud and spit, the Lord would say, watch me open blinded eyes that they might see. If it's nothing but a little donkey, God will say, watch me speak through the donkey yes. and declare what I'm about to do. You see, in God's mind, in God's plan, there is nothing too small for him to use. And many times, it's such a little thing. Notice what Elisha did and did not do. He did not give her anything. He didn't say, you poor woman, let me help you out. I've got this provision for you. But instead, he gave her a word. And many times, all you need is a word from God. Yes. Many times, all you need is God to say, I'm going to do it. I'm going to take care of you. There's no way I'm going to let you fall. Many times, all you need is a word from God. So are you here this morning? You need a word. You see... A word from God can take a mess and make it a message. A word from God can, uh, you know, take a test and make it a testimony. Uh, and many times, all we need is a word from God. 
When we look at the story, the woman says, I don't have anything there. Nothing at all in my house. And then it's as if she suddenly remembers. Well, there's a little, small jar of oil. And I myself have preached this before, and I brought out a big jug of oil. And that is not what God said. That is not the situation. As a matter of fact, when you search deeper into the scripture and you look at the description of the jar of oil, it is more like about something like this that was used for anointing. I have nothing but a small jar of oil. She discounted what God had already provided for her. She discounted the very thing that God would use to perform the miracle that she needed in her life. She discounted the thing that God would use to provide for her and for her sons and for her future. You see, the oil represents the Holy Spirit. I wonder how many times we discount the Holy Spirit. How many times do we discount the anointing? You see, can I tell you that this morning I struggled until I began to deliver the word of God. But many times we discount the anointing. As we begin to talk and we begin to preach the word of God and it becomes alive in us and it becomes alive in the atmosphere, then we cannot discount the anointing and the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And it is here to touch and to minister to each one of us and to make a difference and to make a way. Oh, I feel the anointing power of the Holy Spirit upon my life and I cannot discount the anointing and the oil and God has provided for each one one of us that we are filled with this Holy Spirit. You don't underestimate the anointing. We need more of it. And can I tell you that I believe that each one of us has something that we have forgotten about. That we've discounted that God has given to us. See, God wants to bring about a miracle in your life. So don't underestimate what you already have. The oil in that day was so valuable. It was used as a com co cosmetic. It was used for medicinal purposes. It was used as fuel for lamps, as a substitute for butter. Although butter is better, can I get an amen? Uh, and it was used like money to exchange. So this woman had a little source of money, if you will, a little source of fuel and energy, if you will. A little bit of something that God could use, but yet she did not understand what she had. What you have may seem like nothing at all. But God says, put it in my hand and see what I will do with it. See how I can multiply it. See how I can change it and transform it so that it is the provision that you need. See, I believe that God has everything that we need and it's already in the house. Now you can look at that word house as this is a house. It's the house of God. And I do believe that everything that this church needs is in this house. Hallelujah. The people that God wants to use, they're in this house. The teachers that God wants to use, they're in this house. The ministers and the preachers that God wants to use, they're in this house. The provision that God wants to use in order to uh, advance the kingdom of God in our community, they're already here. Can I get an amen? amen? So look where the woman's focus was. It was on her lack. Where is our focus? Is it on the impossibility? Or the possibility? Can I tell you, let's just my name and tell on myself, okay? That there are times that I wake up and I think, God, how are you going to keep doing this? How is this little group of people going to uh, pay for this land and develop it and build a new church when there are greater churches 
and the community as far as number of people and number of, 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 of finances and all that. And every once in a while, I get disturbed by that. And then I just begin to think, God, it's not even my church, it's yours. And you said that the, uh, that you would build your church and the gates of very hell would not uh, prevail against it. And so we must just use the little that we have and watch God. Yeah. 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 But the woman's focus was on her lack. Do we see the possible? As we begin to look at this situation with the woman, she's told to go borrow some empty jars. In Kentucky, we say borrow. Hey, can I borrow your knife? Let me borrow a little bit of money from you. Just till next Tuesday, as Wimpy would say, right? So that he could have a hamburger today. But when we look at this situation, even the word borrow is prophetic in nature. Because what it means is that her situation is not permanent, it is temporary. In other words, God is about to step on the scene and do something miraculous and take away, and yet he says you must borrow from someone. Temporary situation. What would have happened if she had gathered just a few, what would have happened? She wouldn't have had enough. If she borrowed just a few, her sons would have still been sold into slavery. If she had borrowed just enough, she would have taken care of the situation at hand but not had anything for the future. But it was a measure of faith for her to go and borrow a whole lot. And look at this. Imagine going to someone's house and they know you have a need and they know you're without and they know you're lacking but you say, I need to borrow every pot and pan that you have in the house. They'd be saying, what? And then you had the opportunity to say, but God is about to step on the scene. The prophet has given me a word and I believe the word. And some of the people would have said, that's nonsense. And some of them would say, uh, oh, I'm so excited. Let me gather everything up so I can give it to you because I want to be a part of the miracle. This morning, do you want to be a part of the miracle that God is doing amongst us? Then give your little bit of oil. Give the thing you think is nothing and watch God do the miraculous with it. It's your faith that will determine your blessing and your provision and your future. Imagine if you loaned this woman a pot to put her oil in and you found out that God did a miracle. You probably never use that pot again. You set it up on a shelf and say, this was used to perform a miracle by God. Yeah. <laughs> what you already have can be used by God to perform a miracle. 